Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to a special edition of our Let Us Reason live stream. And uh, today is gonna kick off actually a brand new series that uh, I suggested uh, to Sam, and he kindly agreed uh, to do it with me. And the title uh, said it all: uh, refuting Shabir, and we're talking about Shabir Ali. So. Uh, for a while, he's been getting uh, basically uh, getting away with a lot of claims, and I think it's time for us now to begin to respond in a meaningful way about some of those, you know, uh, answers or claims that that he is giving the impression to his followers that he's somehow refuting some of our teachings. So we are going to invest some time doing this, and I'm thankful, as I said, for our dear brother Sam to be here. Sam, thank you so much, brother, for agreeing to do this segment with me. Thank you for having me, and we just want to glorify the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We beseech the Father in the name of Jesus, his beloved Son, to fill us with the Holy Spirit, to anoint us by his Holy Spirit, to loosen our tongues to speak truth without error by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, and that the Father will perfect our ability to recall the scriptures and interpret them correctly. And we ask that the blood of Jesus cleanses us, purifies our motives, and that the Father will bless everyone who's listening by his Holy Spirit to understand the word and to be able to have an answer to those who try to assault the word, blaspheme the word, because his word is truth and his word is found in the scriptures, the Holy Bible. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Have your way and bless us and save us from error in Jesus' name. Yeah, I'll go Amen. Amen. I need Amen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, moderators, uh, uh, for being here. And uh, as always, uh, uh, guys, you know the rules. If you're here to distract, trust me, I will step in myself. So, brother, um, just give our people uh, just a, a brief overview. Why is it important for us to refute any argument, you know, not to mention Shabir Ali's uh, own claims? Well, I mean, when someone asks me why is it important, because we're told, in fact, uh, brother, if you have your Bible open, do you have it open? Just to get ready, because we're going to need to go into scripture. So I'm going to need. Sure. I will open it for you right now. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone just said, hey, Lolo Mimi said, I've lost a bit of weight. Yeah, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I've lost about 100 pounds. I need to lose more, and I will, by his grace and mercy, by the discipline that the Holy Spirit gives me. So I can have the health I need to glorify Christ in Jesus' name. Yeah, go Amen. So where now, do you want me to go? Now, to answer this question, the book of Jude, which is the second to last book in the Bible, second to last New Testament writing it's only one chapter 25 verses now why is it important let me repeat the question why is it important to refute the objections the assaults the attacks against god's true word his perfectly preserved word the holy bible well because the bible tells us it's important because we need to make sure that we are protecting the flock the flock of the lord jesus christ because among us let me just be real quick and i want to belabor the point but this is going to be first in a series right right so lord willing i'm not going to rush through it i'm not going to belabor the point but i'm not going to go too fast by the grace of god i hopefully i'll do it at the perfect pace by the power of the holy spirit as the holy spirit guides us for the glory of jesus we need you holy spirit not just to do the sessions, but to live for the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit. Guys, mm -hmm. when you hear me keep saying this, I'm not just saying it to put on a show. May the Lord purify my motives. We do not know how much we need the Holy Spirit. We need him for biological life. We need him for spiritual life. We need him to keep us in love with Jesus. And we need him to illuminate us, to understand the word, and give us the power to live the word and proclaim the word for the glory of Jesus. Because without the Holy Spirit, we cannot do it. And this is biblical teaching. Now, among believers, you have babes, babes, meaning those who are born of the spirit. We start off as spiritual babes. And as we drink the milk of the word, we start maturing by the pace of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. The more we walk in union with the spirit, the more we mature. So for the sake of the babes, we need to make sure by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're not being deceived, misled, and their faith shipwrecked until they attain a level of spiritual maturity where by the grace of God, they can see through the lies and blasphemies and won't be affected by it. So that's why it's important. Mm -hmm. now, Jude chapter one, it's only one chapter, 25 verses. Jude chapter one, what does verse three tell us? Yeah, it's a very powerful verse. Behold, while I was making every effort to write about uh, to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly 
for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Amen. So what what does Jude exhort believers of his day to do as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this short epistle, which is full of me? What did he exhort them to do? To contend. Contend. Notice contend. That's that's the language of spiritual warfare. Contend. Fight. Right. So here we are entrusted with the true faith, the true faith from the true God to know the true God as he is, to trust in him to cling to him, to love him and be loved by him. And God has given us this responsibility, a duty and honor to then contend for the true faith revealed and entrusted to the care of believers by the power of the Holy Spirit for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, okay. Verses 13 and 14. Guys, we're going to go as slow as necessary, but not so slow I don't want to rush through the series. This is the beginning of a series where we're going to expose Shirali for the charlatan he is. And I'll comment on that in a minute. And I'm not going to be politically correct. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, what does Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, exhort his young protege, Timothy, to do? Verse 13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. In the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So what does Timothy do with the spiritual treasure that has been entrusted to him by the Holy Spirit through his instruments like the Apostle Paul? What is he supposed to do? Guard, guard it. it protected by the Holy Spirit, empowering him to do so. See, again, do you see the work of the Holy Spirit? Do you see the role of the Holy Spirit? Do you see the important centrality of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer to know the faith, to live the faith, to love the faith, proclaim the faith, defend the faith, and protect the faith? There it is, 2 Timothy 1.14. Is Hallelujah. he going to do it in his Amen. own strength? What's that? Is he going to do it in his own strength? Now, of, co of course not, by the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's right there. So now, just go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, and we can begin. Just want to put things in perspective. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2, specifically verse 2. Very good. What does it say? All right, 2 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, verse 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Yes. Now, understand what he's exhorting him. This favor that you've received from Christ, when it says be strong in that grace, what he means is have no doubt. Don't be shaken. Don't, to the, don't turn to the right or to the left. Have absolutely no doubt of the salvation that Jesus has given you out of his love and mercy and compassion. Be assured that Christ is risen. He is Lord and he has saved you with an everlasting salvation and never doubt it, but stand firm in that conviction. Stand firm in that faith that Jesus is risen. He is Lord and he has saved you with an everlasting salvation. And there is no power that can pluck you out of his hand. He will preserve you forever by his almighty power. But then notice what it says. That faith that you have been given by grace, pass it on to others, qualified men, men who are spiritually mature, men who have been tested and have proven themselves to be men of faith, walking in union with the Holy Spirit, men of integrity who seek the Lord Jesus and his glory and not selfish gain, who do not indulge the flesh. Pass it on to them so that they can then preserve it and safeguard it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then they pass it on to others. It's right there. So I hope that's clear. Amen. Amen. So it uh, uh, looks uh, looks like your look, buddy, is bringing a lot of people. So keep it up, man. I mean, uh, well, we, we, you know, we're getting a lot of views because of that. So that's great. And I just want to make a quick comment to um, a, a young man by the name of Yusuf Sadlan. Yusuf, you're going to be sad. You know why? Because if you keep distracting, I'm going to block you. So right now I gave you a chance and I deleted your dumb comment. So please focus. Thank okay. you. Right. So now, what what are we going to start engaging? Well, guys, he, he didn't do this on his YouTube channel. You need to go to Facebook and find Dr. Shabir Ali's Facebook channel because he does Facebook Live. 
about maybe over a month ago, he did an hour, less than an hour. It was not an hour exactly. About 50 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, over 50 minutes. He did a so-called response to Al Fadi's presentation on original sin in the Quran. Original sin in the Quran. So Shira Ali began <clears throat> by giving an overview of the Holy Bible and some criticisms of the Holy Bible and then <clears throat> entered into responding to Al Fadi's claim about the Quran and the Hadiths. Now, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to do multiple series because there's too much misinformation that needs to be refuted and exposed. And again, let me be politically incorrect. And I had to take some notes down. So if you're if you're wondering what, what I'm turning turning to, here's my composition book. So I had to take some notes. Now, let me be politically incorrect. I know people have lauded Shabrali. They say he's a he's a gentleman and a scholar, and he's erudite, articulate, and and so on and so forth, folks. Let me call a spade a spade. I know you're not going to like it, especially, let me be honest, we have, unfortunately, Christians who become sissified, who become feminized, what I call the feminization of Christianity, the sissification of Christianity. In fact, uh, one Christian apologist and theologian that I greatly admired and I looked up to, his name was Dr. Robert <clears throat> Mori, A. Mori. He used to call these particular Christians evan jellyfishes than jellyfishes sadly christians think that the only way you can be christ-like and imitate jesus if you're kind and considerate and that if you're aggressive if you are <clears throat> direct and if you call a spade and spade then you're not acting like christ you're not walking in the spirit that's a lie that's a bold-faced lie that's not biblical christianity that's not how our lord treated charlatans blasphemers tools of the devil nor did his apostles treat them that way nor did the prophets before our lord jesus christ and let me just be honest shirali is a charlatan he is not an honest person he may come off as being er er erudite and scholarly and humble and and gentle that's all a facade to mask over his blasphemous filthy wicked satanic heart that's filled with hatred towards the true God, filled with hatred towards the true Jesus, filled with hatred towards the true spirit and his true word. Because if you pay careful attention, he mocks and ridicules our faith and our God, but he does it in such a way. Amen. If you're not paying attention, you may miss it because he disarms you with his gentleness and his calm demeanor. He is a son of the devil. He is a liar and a deceiver, and glory to Jesus Christ, I will expose him, and I've challenged him to debate me, and if he's bold and man enough, and he has confidence in his God and his messenger, let him put me in my place, and he knows better, because neither his God nor his messenger can help him against King Jesus, the risen Lord of glory. So I'm sorry. I'm going to have to be honest. Yeah, and, and Sam, you've heard, you know, uh, or you at least you read some of the comments. I mean, he was making fun of what the scripture says that the Lord was strolling in a, yeah. oh, in, in a new day to okay. meet with Adam. Yeah. So. I took some notes. Now, guys, again, I want to exhort you go back and go listen to the presentation for yourselves. Why? Because, again, I'm not <clears throat> here to misrepresent his arguments. I did my best to take succinct notes. Notes so that I could represent them as accurately as possible because I do not want to misrepresent anyone's position because I serve the God of truth. Unlike Shabrali, whose God is Satan, whose God is the devil, because it's his God, his wicked God that boasts in the Quran that he's the best of all deceivers. And I dare Shabrali to debate me on these issues. I challenge you, if you believe Allah's God, put me in my place, but you know better, you know better. And he knows because I've already been told he said he won't debate me. And don't let him use the excuse that I'm rough and tough because if his excuse is that I am mean, right, mean-spirited, then he has to condemn Muhammad because his wicked, immoral prophet murdered people that disagreed with him, raped their women, and treated women like whores, calling it muta. So don't let him use that as an excuse because if he's consistent that I'm mean-spirited, then what do you do with your prophet Muhammad? who murdered people for questioning him or mocking him in poetry, even women poets. 
And what do you do with your prophet that murdered men, raped their women, even women whose husbands were still alive, chapter 4, verse 24, the Quran, and then treated women like your mother, Shabir, like your wife, Shabir, like your daughter, Shabir, as whores under the guise of Zawj al Muta. So don't play that game. It's an excuse because you're afraid. And I don't blame you. I'd be afraid to defend such a wicked, evil, vile, false prophet, a son of Satan, an antichrist named Muhammad. I'd be ashamed too, and I'd be scared. But glory to Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus be glorified through us. Now, that said, he, some of the notes I took, it's going to take more than one series. Basically, as Shib, as Shibri, I'm sorry, I don't mean to insult you, brother. As Alfani said, as I was listening, I even put in my note, look, I said, mocks God coming in the cool of the day. He mocks as he's giving an overview of what Genesis says about the fall of Adam and Eve. He mocks the, the God of the Bible, who's the only true God. Because it says that he came in the cool of the day and mockingly suggests, well, what if it was hot, if it was the, the heat of day, does that mean he wouldn't show up? Because he's a blasphemer. He's a wicked, venomous tool of the devil who hates the true God. So let's unpack that. We have a lot of points, folks. But let's unpack that particular statement to show you because he's blind and does not see. And unfortunately, let me say this. Let me be upfront. Unfortunately, because we have even Christians who do not study the Bible with any great depth. We have Christians who do not plunge the depth of Scripture to find the meat of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, even Christians don't understand the language of Scripture. Why did the Holy Spirit inspire Moses? Because we believe in the traditional view, Moses wrote Genesis by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, Why did he say that... <clears throat> The Lord God was walking in the cool of the day. And it doesn't say the Lord God. It says that they heard, Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Let's look at that. Brother, if you can go to Genesis 3 verse 8. But sadly, most translations drop the ball and translate the Hebrew word kol as sound as opposed to voice. So now do me a favor. I want you to go to the King James Version if you have access yeah. to it. Yes. King James? Okay. We'll do that. You it's keep not, talking, brother. Read, I'll, I'll guys, I'm going to show you the Trinity in this verse. Folks, everything, let me repeat, because I want people to hear this before he even reads it. Everything, if you believe the Bible, these collection of books are inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you believe that, then no, everything is there by deliberate design. The Holy Spirit inspired the authors to write what they did using their human personalities for a reason. Every jot and tittle has been placed there by the Holy Spirit for a reason. Even the statement that he's about to read was there to point to a greater spiritual truth. And I'm going to unpack the meat. You guys want meat? I'm going to give you meat. Amen. Genesis 3 verse 8 by the grace of God. All right. Genesis 3 verse 8 using the King James translation. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Okay, now I want you to read slowly. Or I'm going to repeat slowly what he just read and focus. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking. That's a very strange way of saying they heard the Lord God walking. F folks, pay attention. It doesn't say they heard the Lord God walking. It says they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. Okay, I want everyone to pay attention to that. Why not simply say they heard the Lord God walking? Because here you're being introduced to the word of God. That word who later became flesh. That word who took on a human nature, physical body from the holy consecrated womb. Of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Lord God is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God in His pre human existence. No, it's not an anthropomorphism, Mason. No. See? This is what happens when Christians think they understand the text. No, it's not an anthropomorphism. The voice of the Lord God is a divine person. That divine person who became the man Christ Jesus. They heard. The voice, because the voice here is, a, I'm going to prove that. 
But the second thing I want you to catch, which your English translation robs you of, unless you at least have access to the lexicon or can read the Hebrew text. It says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Let me give you the Hebrew phrase. Are you ready? Are you guys ready for the Hebrew phrase? It's Laruach Hayom. Yeah, Laruach Hayom. The spirit is mentioned. Oh, you got it. Let me repeat it again. The voice of the Lord God walking, la ruach hayom. Literally, the voice of the Lord God walking by the spirit of the day. By the spirit of the day. There's the Trinity right there. And let, me, let me just mention something, Sam. This is just to prove that someone like Shabir is way out of his league when he tries to present himself as a knowledgeable person about our Bible he neither knows Arabic nor he knows even the Hebrew. And I am glad, basically, that you're focusing on this point because I was extremely disappointed when I heard him mocking the Lord. Exactly. But his mockery is going to be turned back against him because now you're going to see the depth of Scripture, the meat of Scripture, that this is the Word of God and God is triune, showing that his prophet is a son of the devil and Antichrist and Allah is the devil. And we're going to mock his prophet and humiliate his prophet for the glory of the triune God. But let me unpack this, guys. La Ruach, and don't take my word for it, go read the Hebrew. La Ruach Hayom. So literally it's, it's I heard, they heard, not I heard. They heard the voice of Yahovah Elohim, right, walking by the spirit of the day. So now let's unpack what the Holy Spirit placed there for those with eyes to see and ears to hear are supposed to discover. Why does it say, La Ruach Hayom, the spirit of the day, because this was the time of man's darkness, fall into darkness. This is when Adam and Eve plunged into darkness. So who shows up? Jesus Christ by the spirit of illumination, because it is Jesus who illuminates us, who lightens our path to find our way out of the darkness into the light. So I'm going to give, I'm gonna give a minute to sink in. And, and folks, uh, what Sam is saying, you can find it online. I'm, I'm really surprised that somebody like Shabir didn't even do the, the homework that he's supposed to do. Go to Bible Hub and you'll see all of these things. Brother, I I'm not even aware of how many Christians even know this. I'm not trying to boast. May the Lord crucify my flesh. I didn't discover this from a commentary. And I didn't discover this from hearing someone. Once I heard the word, cool of the day, I knew because I know this is God's word. Here, the Lord bears witness. I'm not lying to you guys. I knew because this is God's word. I knew the Holy Spirit placed that phrase there for a reason. There has to be something deeper. And I suspected that the word cool Amen. may have been the word rock spirit. And I went and checked and the spirit confirmed that yes, that was placed there deliberately because in the Hebrew, the word cool or breeze is ruach, the word for spirit. So the Holy Spirit wants you to see something deeper going on in the narrative. And I'm going to say something, Sam, and you know you can comment on it, brother, if you feel like it's relevant. What does Luke tell us about Jesus after his baptism? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Well, amen. Right amen. there. Luke 4.1. Matthew 4.1. Right? Mark 1, 12. Exactly. So this is the little translation, folks. And I'm going to do an entire series on my YouTube channel because this is me. This is the first time I've been I'm unpacking this. This is the first time that I'm aware of that I'm unpacking this. I, I don't remember talking about it. But anyway, understand what you read. Let's unpack the meat. The voice of the Lord God walking by the spirit of the day. Now, someone said, well, why spirit of the day? Now, let's unpack why spirit of the day now are you ready now i'm going to confirm for you spirit of the day means the spirit of illumination the spirit that lightens every man who's in darkness because understand the context it is not a coincidence that the lord jesus shows up with the holy spirit right at the moment adam and eve have plunged into darkness so now jesus by the spirit comes to lighten their path to bring them out of the darkness that they have now plunged into you with me there? Now, let me prove that to you. Let me prove it to you. La Ruach Hayom, spirit of the day. Ha's the definite article, Yom. Let's go to Genesis 1, brother. Genesis 1. Now, you can read another translation if you want. Genesis 1, sure. verses 2 to 5. 
All right. Uh, just one quick comment. Uh, somebody by the name TL. TL is lecturing us because I uh, assumed that the lady that was interviewing Shabir is his sister. No, it's and it turned out to be his daughter. Okay. And he's asking us to get our facts straight. Who cares if it is his sister, his wife, or his daughter? Is that really the topic right now? For that reason, I'm going to give you some time to think about it. Goodbye. <laughs> okay. Now, let me prove to you, folks, the word day in Genesis itself points to a greater spiritual reality. Day, light, in contrast to darkness and night. Day, light, in contrast to... <clears throat> Darkness and night, night and darkness. So that day points to light. And it points to the greater spiritual reality that we are children of the day, children of the light. We are not children of the night, children of darkness. I'm going to prove this to you. Let's start with Genesis 1. This is why I say we're going to have to do multiple series. So let's go Genesis 1, verses 2 to 5, brother. All right. Genesis 1, verses 2 to 5. I'm going to start with verse 2. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Okay, the Spirit of God there. Now notice the connection with the Spirit of God. And light, darkness, day and night. Watch. Right. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. Okay, pause there, the brother. What did he call the light? Day. So, la ruach hayom, the spirit of day, the spirit of light, the spirit of illumination. Let it sink in before we move on. He called the light day. And in Genesis 3, it says, la ruach hayom, the spirit of the day. Because the Holy Spirit is not of the night because the spirit doesn't bring darkness he brings light and illumination are you catching it brother absolutely brother now yeah, keep absolutely. going keep going so you right. can see that the night represents darkness represents satan i'll show you that's right so we'll start with five again god called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning one day now again to connect day with light and night with darkness let's go to genesis 1 14 18 because in genesis 1 actually i even noted it genesis 1 if you read 14 18 it even uses the word hayom hayom in verse 14 16 the same phrase hayom in verse 14 16 but let's read genesis 1 14 18 and then i'm going to connect it with the new testament very good genesis 1 starting from verse 14 to 18 then god said uh, said let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them the day from what the days uh, the day from the night do you see that day and night cannot mix day and night do not cohabit i can hear my voice through your computer day is separate from the night as light is separate from darkness the two shall never mix okay so now keep going and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, here's what's interesting. Sign can also point to spiritual signs in the language of the Bible. So, yes, I'm not denying that it's referring to the sun and the moon to use to mark off days and seasons. But also note it says the word sign. And in the Bible, that word sign is often used for miraculous signs or signs that point to greater truth. So are you seeing from Genesis 1, God has already inspired the Genesis account of creation to point to greater spiritual signs, spiritual truths that you who are born of the Spirit are supposed to see by plunging the depth of Scripture, not just reading on the surface level. Amen. Okay, keep going. All right. We'll All continue. Wait, did you finish it? Yeah. Yeah, verse 15, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made light on the earth. Okay, keep going. Just, I won't stop you. I'll let you finish. No problem. Verse 16, God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Okay. God so we played... have... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought Go you were finished. No, no, finish it. Go to 18. I apologize. Okay. 
Uh, verse 17, God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and so separ uh, and uh, to separate the light from darkness. Separate light from darkness. Separate day from night. Light yeah. separate from darkness. Day separate from night. You guys seeing it, right? Now, well, let me know when you're done with verse 18. And just the last clause. And God saw that it was good. Okay, now, guys, let's repeat. Genesis 3, 8. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking by the spirit and the spirit of the day. You're supposed to see a deeper spiritual truth there. Why is it spirit of the day? Because it's the spirit of light, the spirit who gives light, the spirit who illuminates. And why at this juncture? Because this is the moment that Adam and Eve plunged in darkness. This was the hour of darkness that swallowed them. So here Jesus in his mercy comes with the spirit to illuminate them, to lighten their path, to find their way out of their darkness into the light. Everyone getting Amen. it? Amen. Now go to Luke 22, 53 to show you how now the Bible picks up this imagery, this creation account of day and night, light and darkness, and spiritualizes it. I'm going to show you now from scripture, Luke 22, 53. All right, Luke 22, verse 53. While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this hour and the power of darkness are yours. Did you catch it? Darkness is about to swallow up the light of the world, Jesus Christ. It's the power of darkness as Holy Spirit enables us to recall these passages, interpret them perfectly. Holy Spirit, perfect these gifts in us for the glory of Jesus. But now again, let's go to John 1. John 1, verses 1 to 5. Watch what's going to happen here, folks. Watch them eat. Focus. You're getting meat. I may just do the entire session on this, this very passage that points to the Trinity. If we go to Genesis 1, uh, John 1, I'm sorry. How does Genesis 1, 1 begin? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was Genesis 1, 1. John 1 now gives you an inspired exposition of Genesis 1 because how does John 1 begin? Read it for us. John 1, verses 1 all the way to 5. Can you hear me? Are you there? We lost you then. Oh, you cannot hear me. That's why. Yeah, I was like, what happened, dude? Hello? John right. 1, verse uh, 1 5. John 1, starting from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Pause right there. Here's the Genesis account of creation. In the beginning, in the beginning, the word was there with God, and God used the word to bring all creation into existence. So here's an echo of the Genesis 1 account of creation. But now notice what John does with the light and darkness of Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5. Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5. What does John do with the imagery of light and darkness? Now read. Yeah. I'm going to read three again. All things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has been into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, folks, do you see now biblical confirmation? I'm not reading too much into these passages. I'm actually discovering what was always there by deliberate design of the Holy Spirit. John just told you the physical light and darkness point to spiritual light and darkness. Did you catch it? John 1, 4. In him was light, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it, comprehend it, contain it. So why do you have in Genesis 3, verse 8, the voice of the Lord walking, la ruach hayom, because that voice is the word of John 1. That's Jesus, the voice slash word of the Father, appearing by the Spirit to now illuminate, lighten the darkness that Adam and Eve have plunged into to save them out of that darkness. It's right there. But now I'm going to have more proof. More proof so people don't think I'm making it up. Are we ready for more proof? Yeah, I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, Shabir well, did what he did. Yeah, yeah. So that now we can show the depth of what is meant by that clause. And Genesis 3, that's the Trinity, brother. 
the voice of the Lord God, voice of the Father, who is with the Holy Spirit to illuminate them. There it is, the Trinity, right there in Genesis 3, verse 8. That's why in Genesis 3, 22, guys, he says, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Now it makes sense, like one of us, because that's the voice speaking about the Father, whose voice he is, and the Holy Spirit who's accompanying him has become like one of us. Genesis 3, 22. Thank you, Shabir. You wish your filthy Quran, your book of porn, the book of the devil, had the depth that God sureward had, the Holy Bible. Thank you, Shabir. Thank you for allowing the devil to use you so that the servants of God could expose you and your prophet for the glory of Jesus. Thank you, sir. Now, let's see if you're man enough to debate me. Now, that said, and by the way, send this link to him. Make sure he knows my challenge. Now, more evidence that the light and the day. Remember Genesis 1? Day, light, night, darkness. More proof those physical acts of creation are meant to point to spiritual truths. Day, light, night, darkness. Day and night never mix. Light, darkness never mix. Now, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Okay, watch what's going to happen. You want me to start from verse 1? Yeah, just start. Now, guys, pay attention. Genesis account of creation. Day, light, night, darkness. Now, notice what Paul does with that language. All right, First Thessalonians chapter 5, starting from verse 1. Now, as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a, uh, like labor pains upon a woman with, ch with a child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. Darkness. Notice the language of Genesis. You're not in darkness. So keep going. That the day would overtake you like a thief. The day. Right? See, brother, so they can simmer on this. Darkness. We're not in darkness, but we are the children of the day, the day of the Lord that will come upon evildoers with destruction. Now keep reading. Watch. Watch what he does with it. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. Coincidence? Wow. Yeah. You are the sons of the light, sons of the day, and it's the day of the Lord for us, but the day of destruction for them. You're not in darkness. Now keep reading. We're not of night nor of darkness. We're not what? We're not of night nor of darkness. Are you telling me this is a coincidence or Paul is deliberately interpreting the Genesis 1 account of creation to show those physical acts pointed to spiritual truths? Physical day, physical light point to the spiritual day, spiritual light, and the children of God who are the children of day, children of light, in contrast to night and darkness, which represents Satan and his children. It's right there. Amen. Now keep going all the way to 10, and uh, I won't stop. All right, verse 6. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, for God has not distant us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Okay, now Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. Guys, the Genesis 1 account is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. Because the imagery of day, light, night, darkness, all throughout the Bible. And its spiritual implications brought out. Because now Colossians 1 13. Colossians right. 1 13. Colossians 1 verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so wait, we were in the kingdom of darkness. And where are we now? We were in the kingdom of darkness, brother? That's correct. We are in now, the kingdom of darkness. Read verses 9 to 12. Oh, we lost uh, it. In Colossians 1? 
Yeah, same Colossians. Remember, we were in the kingdom power of darkness. He took us out of it. Now read verses 9 to 12 to see what he else says there. Watch here. Yeah, Colossians from, 9 to 12. Starting from verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience jealously, uh, joyously, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Wait. We are saints in light, taken out of darkness? That's right. Are you guys seeing the imagery again? Genesis 1, an account of physical creation, but it's more than that. The physical creation points to spiritual realities, to signs of spiritual truths. Are you seeing it now? We are now partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light because we're bought, brought out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, the son whom he loves. You see it? It's right there. And it's the repeated teaching of scripture. A few more examples. We'll go back to Genesis. Now go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. All right. 1 John 1, one verse 5. Verse 5. Mm -hmm. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. God is what? Light. And in him, is there's what? There is no darkness at all. Again, coincidence or deliberate echo of the Genesis account of creation? Amen. Amen. You try seeing it, right? Who would have thought that Genesis 3 verse 8 is a reference to the Trinity and the work of the Trinity in saving mankind? I don't think it's sinking in for, for most of the brother here. Genesis 3, 8, it's the voice of the Lord God accompanied by the spirit of the day of illumination coming to now rescue Adam and Eve out of the darkness which they plunged into. That's the Trinity working together for the salvation of mankind that's now plunged in darkness. And I'm going to prove to you the voice is the word who is Jesus. And I'm going to even quote Jewish sources that identify that voice as the word of God. I'll prove it to you. By the grace of God. And I have a two-part article on this. On the voice of the Lord being the word of God who then becomes Jesus. So I'm going to give you the links. And hopefully, brother, you can put them in the description box as well. I want you to read these articles. Okay, now, before we do that, one more reference. One more reference to darkness and, and day and night and light. Acts 26, 18. Acts 26, 18. When our Lord Jesus appears to the apostle Paul and commissions him. Acts 26, 18. Notice what he says. Acts 26, verse 18. Yes. To open their... Uh, I'm going to start from uh, 17, brother. Uh, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the domain of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Wait, so they're going to go from darkness to light? From the power of Satan to God? Amen. So notice darkness, Satan. Light is God. God is light in whom there is no darkness. So when I turn from Satan, I'm turning from night, from darkness, to God, who is light, to the day. And I become a son of the day, a son of the light, right? And I belong to the triumph God. So everyone see this, right? So why is the spirit in Genesis 3 called the spirit of the day? La Ruach, Ruach Hayom, spirit of the day. Because he's the spirit who brings illum illumination. He's the spirit who brings you into the day. He's the spirit who lightens your darkness and destroys the darkness. And this confirms what I said at the beginning. I said you cannot have biological life unless the Holy Spirit gives you biological life. And you definitely cannot live the spiritual life and remain faithful to the Lord and escape the power of, this, of Satan unless the Holy Spirit seals you and fills you 
and teaches you and guides you and preserves you for the glory of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. Everyone got it? Hallelujah. Okay, now, what proof is there that the voice that they heard walking is not simply the sound of God's feet? That's why if you read a translation that renders Genesis 3.8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. Bad translation. Bad translation. This is why I love the King James. Because here in the King James it says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. Because, and, and let me say, guys, Sam is not attacking the scripture. At least somebody take this. No, no, he's talking about translations. Exactly. Look at the original. The original, by the way, you go to Bible Hub, they'll do an original and an English interlineal right under it. So you see what's going on. Let me prove to you that that word, kol, it's, and they heard the kol of the Lord God should be voice. Let's go to Genesis 3, verse 8. We're going to do multiple series on this. Genesis 3, verse 8. It's not sound of Jehovah God. It should be the voice. Okay, now when you go there, let me show you. All now, right. Is that verb or, or that word? Kol is used two other times in that same chapter. The word kol is used two other times in the same chapter. I always have a hard time pronouncing Q. Kuk. Anyway, what does it say? Read it for me, Genesis 3 8. Uh, verse 8. They heard the sound of the, the Lord God walking. Uh, you didn't repent. You went to the translation, said sound. It's not sound, it's voice. You're talking King James? You yeah, you've got to go back to King James. Oh, okay. So I, I just didn't realize the one at King James. So and they say ESV, nope. ESV uses the voice too. Excellent. I my hats off to them. No, Lydia, sound is not fine. Don't debate me, sister. I know your sister. No, it's not sound because you're robbing Jesus of glory. Because this passage is talking about Jesus. So if you say sound is fine, then you're helping the anti-Trinitarians. Good job doing that, Lydia Anello. You're wrong. It's not sound, it's voice. And by the way, there's a different word for sound in the Hebrew, just uh, just in case. Um, okay, yeah. verse 8. Yes, and we heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay, now, voice. Now, I'm going to prove to you it should be voice because that word, kol, okay, is used two other times in that chapter. Go to Genesis 3, verse 10. Okay, Genesis 3, verse 10. Yeah. Okay, verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. Okay, now what if it's the same word, kol. Mm -hmm. And Adam is saying, I heard your voice in the garden. Now translate that as, I heard your sound in the garden. Does that make sense? Right. It's the same word, kol. I heard your kol. Who would translate that, I heard your sound? Right. So it's voice. But now let me show you again. Genesis 3.17. Same word is used in Genesis 3. And this is all in my articles, by the way. I did a two-part article on this. And I'm going to give you the links by the grace of the triune God. Now notice 17. The word is used again. There. Verse 17. And unto Adam he says, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. So I translate it. Because you listen to the sound of your wife. Anyone translate it that way? No. It's the same word, though. Genesis 3, 17. It's because you obeyed the call of your wife, the voice of your wife. Translate it sound. Because you obeyed the sound of your wife. I heard your sound. Why in verse 10 and 17, they'll translate it voice. But in Genesis 3, 8, they translate it sound. Because this is the influence of anti-Trinitarian, anti-supernatural bias that has poisoned even conservative Trinitarian scholars from rendering the text in an accurate manner, lest they be accused of reading too much Trinity into the Old Testament. You see? Now let me show you where coal is used again. Go to Genesis 4, verse 10. God speaking to Cain. Genesis 4, verse 10. Genesis 4. I'm still using the King James, by the way. Uh, verse 10. And he said... What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now let's translate it sound. What have you done, Cain? The sound of the, of the blood of your brother cries out to me. The sound of your brother's blood. Anyone translate it as sound there? 
Guys, why is it in Genesis 4.10, they translated voice. Genesis 3.17, they translated voice. Genesis 3.10, translated voice. But Genesis 3.8, they translated as sound. Anyway, point being, it's the voice of the Lord God. Now, can I prove to you the voice of God is the word of God, whom the New Testament identifies as Jesus? The voice of God is the word of God. The word of God is God's voice. God's voice is his word. Go to 1 Kings 19, verse 9, brother. Now, you don't need to read the King James here. 1 First First Kings, Kings 19. 1 Kings 19, verse 9. Uh, if you can, when you get there, did you mute yourself again? Yeah, I think he muted himself again. Can't hear you. You're muted, buddy. I know. I just didn't want people like to uh, be bothered by the noise assertion. So, First Kings nineteen, verse nine. Yeah. Read it. All right, verse nine. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, "Wait, wait, what are read you doing here, Elijah? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, guys, I want you to read it slowly again." Read who came to Elijah the prophet, 1 Kings 19, 9. Read it slowly. Pay attention. Who came to the prophet Elijah? And, and folks, pay attention to who was speaking to Elijah, okay? All right. So verse 9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Okay, did you see who's talking to him? The word of Jehovah came to Elijah and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So here's Jesus, the word in his pre-human existence, coming to Elijah and speaking to him. Now, guys. And brother, I want to say this. It's in the masculine because if they read Arabic, uh, also translation of this, it will yeah. say kalima, and kalima is feminine, but it's identified in the masculine. The bar. In Hebrew, it's Davar or Davar. But guys, I'm going to have them read 1 Kings 19.9 and verse 13 back to back. Now, I need you to read two verses. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9 and verse 13 back to back. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, which he read with verse 13. Now, pay attention. All right. I'll read 9 one more time. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, Where are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Read the 13 again. Verse 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Did you see him? 13 says, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And the Hebrew word is kol, the same word. And kol came to Elijah and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? But in verse 9, it said that was the word. The word came to him saying, the voice came to him saying, and the word and the voice said the same thing. What are you doing here, Elijah? Amen. So wait, you're telling me the word is the voice, the voice is the word? Is that what you guys are telling me? And now is that what it's saying? The word is the voice, the voice is the word, because what the word said, the voice said, the voice said, what the word said? I, I hope everybody's paying attention to this. Yeah, it's afraid. not an accident that it's here this way. Oh, but it gets better. Go to Psalm 103, 19 and 20 to 21. Psalm 103, 19 and 20 to 21. What sound, Alex? The word cold means voice. The voice is the word. The word is the voice. Anyway, for, uh, Psalm 103, 19 to 21. I want you to pay attention to verse 20. Psalm 103, 20. Guys, pay attention. Well, you know what? Yeah, what translation are you reading? King James. Okay. All right, yeah, uh, read it. Go ahead, read it for me. That should be good. 19 to 21? Yes. 
All right, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. I'll read that part again. Obeying the voice of his word. Wait, the angels obey the voice of the word? So the word has a voice that they hear and they obey? Right. Did you guys catch it? Psalm 103, 20, with God on his throne is the word whose voice the angels obey. Obeying the voice of his word. So here the voice of the word, the word and the word's voice. Okay, now let me give you the final one. Then we're going to read what the Jews said. The Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament done by Jews called the Targumim, the Targums. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Isaiah, Isaiah 6, verse, verse 8. 8. Hmm? King James? Yes, yeah, so you can change. You, now you can read any translation now. It's up to you. I'll keep it, uh, King James. Least you uh, get upset and uh, we can't. The least, uh, I'm the least of the brethren. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Isaiah 6, verse 8. Then yes. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Pause right there. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, The voice of the Lord speaking. Whom shall I send who'll go for us? Oh, my goodness. The voice of the Lord spoke, and I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send who'll go for us? Amen. Hmm. And obviously, you can make a connection in the Gospel of John with this, but I'm not going to spoil yeah. it in case no, you don't want to go there. Running out. Now, how did the Jews interpret this? Now, here, let me give you my article. Here's part one and part two of Genesis 3.8. Here it is. I'm going to put it in the text section in the YouTube channel, and then I'll send it to you. Here it is. That's part one. How did the Jews understand these references? Here, let me show you how the Jewish translation of these Old Testament books into Aramaic, known as the Targums, Targumim, how they interpreted it. Okay? Are you ready? Let me read. Let's go there. Hold on. Let me get you there. Here it is. This is from, there are a couple of Aramaic paraphrases of Genesis. This one in particular is the Targum, Targum of Ankelos and Jonathan ben Uziel. Targum Ankelos and Jonathan ben Uziel with the Jerusalem Targum. Targum Ankelos and Jerusalem Targum. How did they interpret it? Genesis 3, verse 8? Guys, here, let me read it for you. And they heard the voice of the word of the Lord God walking in the garden. What? Here it goes. Here it is. Targum Ankelos. Ankelos. Here it is. They heard the voice of the word of the Lord God walking in the garden. Okay, now, what about the Targum of Jerusalem? The Jerusalem Targum. These are all Jewish paraphrases of the Old Testament into, into Aramaic. And the word of the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, wait, 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 who called to him? The word of the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, and then again, Targum Ankelos, and he said, The voice of thy word I heard in the garden. The voice of thy word I heard in the garden. Did you catch it? <clears throat> God, Adam saying to God, The voice of your word I heard. The voice of the word they heard. There it is. Oh, but wait, a couple more. Jerusalem Targum. And the Lord, word of the Lord God said, Behold, Adam. Wait, so who came to him? The word of the Lord. The Targum of Jerusalem says that was the word of the Lord. Targum Ankelos says that was the word of the Lord. And it was the voice of the word of the Lord that they heard. The Jews understood. The Jews understood. This was the word of God whose voice they heard walking. Now here, let me read again. Targum Ankelos. And they heard the voice of the word of the Lord God. They heard the voice of the word of the Lord God. And then Adam says, and I heard the voice of thy word heard I in the garden. The voice of thy word heard I in the garden. Wait, 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 wait. The Jews understood that the voice of the Lord God that they heard walking is the word of God. Here it is. It's all my articles. I got to get you part two. All right. A couple more references and we're going to wrap things up. Notice now the Aramaic 
translation of Isaiah 6 verse 8. You remember in Isaiah 6 verse 8 it said, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Here is the Jewish translation of Isaiah 6 into Aramaic, right? Which is the Targum of Jonathan bin Uzziel. Uzziel. Now watch here. Watch here. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, which said, wait. The Hebrew says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, the Aramaic translation done by Jews, done by Jews. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, which said, folks, even Jews who are not Christians, who are not Trinitarians, who don't believe in the New Testament, who reject Jesus, could see from their reading of the Hebrew Bible, the voice of the Lord God is a person who is the word of the Lord God sent by God to speak to God's servants who claims to be God, is worshipped as God, and does things that God only can do. Folks, the Old Testament is Trinitarian, proving an anonymous prophet. Muhammad is a son of the devil, a wicked, blasphemous dog of the devil who's burning in hell because Allah is a false god. Glory to the triune God. And thank you, Shabir for giving us opportunity to shame you and expose you for the charlatan you are and glorify the God of Muhammad, who's the God of the Bible, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge. There you go. Let me get you and down I, the link. And uh, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, just in case, I, I dropped a link for Bible Hub in case you need it. Uh, so that will be helpful to you. Just the beginning. Lord Jesus willing, more to come. We're going to end this man's reputation because he needs to stop his blasphemy. He needs to go find something else to do. Maybe go panhandle, right? But he needs to stop as an apologist because his blasphemies will end and his prophet will be destroyed in the eyes of everyone by Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, thank you so much, brother. Uh, this was rich. In fact, I'm going to add a lot of these things in a description because I want to make sure people benefit from this particular episode. And uh, let's plan on doing the same thing next week, brother. And if your schedule permits, we'll do it on a weekly basis because this is extremely important, folks. I want you to know why we're doing this. We're not here to sit down and mock somebody. He's the one who's mocking our Lord. And he opened the door for us to try to clarify things. And we want you to benefit from it so you can see how deep the word of God was by that simple clause that this guy mocked. And by the way, brother, let me tell them why we're doing it. Proverbs 26, verse 5. Proverbs 26, 5. Read it. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he becomes wise in his own mind. And this arrogant son of the devil thinks he's wise and scholarly. So it's now time to silence this fool and his fake God for the glory of Jesus. Proverbs 26, verse 5. All right. And by the way, folks, uh, I want to just uh, give a shout out for a brother here by the name John Betty, who just had a surgery. Uh, so we praise the Lord for uh, uh, that the surgery went well. Thank you, brother, for being here with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the moderators. Uh, thank you for all of your interactions. I'm, I'm watching things. Uh, you guys are amazing. And yes, I did put a couple of people on timeout, and I, it looks like you guys blocked a few. I don't care. If they're here not to learn and just distract, that's the way we're going to handle it. And, um, brother, thank you so much. And you. Uh, once you... Uh, Guys, pray, pray August 12th, big day that God will amen. deliver me and my daughters miraculously so I can continue to serve the Lord. August 12th, amen. Christ is risen, and I love you, brother. Thank you. Amen. Once you send the links, I will go ahead and put it in the description as well. Uh, folks, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you again next week uh, with another series of live streams, including this important one with our dear brother, possibly even two. We may even finish Christology next week. Amen. So um, God bless you all. This is Al-Fadi over and out. Take care.